Thanks, Jeff and Eleanor, for uh, the leadership on the, on the CANOE initiative. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, to be reacquainted with old friends and to meet some new friends. So um, I'll begin. Uh, the Neighborhoods and Health Group, it's becoming increasingly clear to me, is about social determinants and probably walkability. Uh, so that's kind of the physical activity folk, I think, will probably congregate there, as well as folks interested in uh, social environments and their impacts on health outcomes. And then, you know, over the course of my career, when I've ever looked at the physical environment and the social environment, the social stuff usually trumps the physical, so it's, it's imperative in terms of health effects that uh, we get some good um, consistent measurement on the social environment indicators out of CANOE for everybody's purposes. Okay, now, it's like the North Star here. Hold on. That worked. Um, so neighborhoods and health, for those of you who are, are unaware of the sort of field of neighborhoods and health, there's a, a fairly large body of evidence that exposure to neighborhood environments over time has an incremental influence on health status above and beyond individual characteristics. So uh, this area really was born out of education research, actually, uh, looking at um, trying to develop mathematical models to tease apart the effect of the school environment on kids' outcomes independent of those children's um, individual factors that they, they brought to school. That was actually then transferred into, well, neighborhood environments may have this incremental influence too. Can we figure that out using uh, something called hierarchical modeling or multi-level modeling? And that really took off in the 1990s with people like Anna Diaz-Rue in the United States, demonstrating that cardiovascular risk was not just about individual behaviors, but also about neighborhood environments. I would say also from the purposes of canoe and neighborhoods and health, we are definitely seeing a maturing of Canadian health data uh, alongside an ability to see into places like never before, right? So these things are coalescing, Canoe is coming at the absolute right time, and I guess the conversations that we're having are about, okay, we can see into places like never before, how do we harness that systematically so that people can use it for really important uh, studies of human health? So uh, when I talk about neighborhoods and health to students, I usually put this uh, map up of Montreal first off and uh, get them to think about it a little bit. This is, um, uh, Daniel, remember this from, yeah, years of Geography 303, uh, I think, anyway. So it's still a, a good thing to look at when we think about, trying to get us to think about the health effects of neighborhoods and think about all of the things that could be happening in a neighborhood that may influence our health status. And so this is um, a picture of Montreal, very small neighborhood level, it's life expectancy for men, and the variation from uh, the green on the West Island where I live, men can expect to live now over 80 there, but on the East End, there's a 12 year gap. Now some of that is selection, right? Absolutely. But every time we look at this, and there's always an um, environmental component to it, and the the thing about environmental components is when we do something about them, we get to affect a lot of people. And we affect a lot of people in a way that we don't tend to exacerbate health inequalities like individual interventions do. So that's just the context that I would uh, provide for neighborhoods and health. I'm going to switch to talk a little bit about neighborhood walkability. And I'm, there's a slide that comes up that says neighborhood walkability matters more than I thought. Because when I first got interested in the research on neighborhood walkability, I thought it was a bit self-indulgent, human geographer, um, looking at this stuff, trying to measure environments, and you know, would we see anything, right? Well, it turns out, I, you know, we're seeing quite a lot. What, what we mean by walkability, there's a number of ways we could measure it. Uh, uh, typically, it's a composite index that takes account of street connectivity, land use mix, so how varied your neighborhoods are in terms of your land use mix, and population density. When we look internationally at a meta-analysis of the only studies that do a, a really decent methodological job of this, uh, overall, um, neighborhood walkability does matter in terms of demonstrable step counts per day. And this is the most, I think, a compelling thing from um, in terms of selection effects, you know, trying to contain some of those selection effects that keep coming up in conversation. If we, this is um, data from the National Population Health Survey. Uh, it's work by Rania Wasfi, a PhD student of mine who's currently at the postdoc at UDM. And this is showing the sort of natural history of 
body mass index for men in the Canadian population from 1994 to 2006. Now the black line is the whole, all men in Canada over that time, and you can see that there's sort of this natural history to, to body mass index, right? Natural and scare quotes there, right? So that over time, male BM, BMI tends to increase. If you look at the blue dotted line on the top, that's men who lived in the least walkable neighborhoods throughout the whole survey time. And these are thousands and thousands of Canadians. The, the red and the green lines are perhaps the most interesting because we kind of get around that selection effect stuff by looking at people who moved into or out of uh, walkable neighborhoods. So the red line, which is a very unfavorable line, shows men who move from high to low walkable neighborhoods during the course of the survey. And they do pay a, a price on terms of BMI. And we control for a bunch of other factors that we would think would have some bearing on BMI here, of course. And the, um, the green line, which is really nice, and these are men who move from low to high walkable neighborhoods. And it seems as though that movement can actually dampen that sort of natural progression of BMI with age. And if we had a drug that could do this, we'd be rich, right? But we have neighborhoods that can do this. So I think there's a compelling argument for adding these types of measures to other cohorts across Canada in this landscape of maturing data. So we were asked um, to do a little bit on quick wins. I think it, uh, in the short term, three to six months seems really short, but anyway, we'll see what we can do. I think we're gonna be looking at identifying data sets that um, need some kind of connection between neighborhood conditions and health outcomes. Uh, we'll do some scans of uh, analysis of, uh, of walkability indices because we need to reach back historically for some of these. We also need to have some debate about what we want to measure, what the best metrics are, where the correlations are, where it doesn't matter, that we shouldn't be spending hours of intellectual sweat when the correlation is 0.9 to get a slightly better metric when a lot of the off the shelf will do. So I think we could have that conversation. Um, food environment, I don't know if it's come up. Uh, I don't think it really has come up today. That's a big part of uh, some of the health outcomes. And uh, we have really rich data in Canada to do that. So we'll do some scans of that. And I, I hope the neighborhood group can also provide some standardized guidance on geocoding and what the right, um, what's the right geocode. And I'm just going to seed it there. Six-digit postal code is my absolute favorite. And I, I think people are going to argue with me on that, but I love it. It works generally in urban areas pretty well, although I think we need guidance on what happens when we go to rural areas and semi-urban. Um, Near-term priorities, I'll say... Um, this is a, an area, I think, of high priority. It's to revise the Canadian Marginalization Index. Uh, my co-lead, Jim Dunn, who really apologizes, he'll be here tomorrow, uh, who can talk a bit more about this. He's one of the developers of, of CanMarge. Um, we have a bit of a gap in social data in Canada at the neighborhood level caused by the National Household Survey in 2011. Many of you are nodding. Yeah, if you work with the data, you know it's a bit frustrating when you try to get uh, drilled down into small geographic scales. So I think there's a role for us to maybe fill in that gap a bit, uh, interpolate from 2006 and 2016. We're about to have a release of awesome census, long-form census data, and because of the... Um, the online, uh, the way that the census are now collected online, those data won't be years away, they're months away, which is, which is fabulous. Um, I, just to show you how important um, that marginalization index is for health outcomes, this is a way in which we can really see how urban inequalities get, quote, under the skin. So this is women living in the most materially deprived and ethnically concentrated uh, Toronto neighborhoods around the Toronto East General Hospital who present um, at the gestational diabetes clinic. And so the higher you score on the 50 gram glucose challenge test, the more likely you, you are to end up on insulin while you're uh, pregnant, the more likely you are to have a birth outcome that's unfavorable. And if we look across the, the quintiles of these very ethnically concentrated neighborhoods, uh, the, the risk for those poor outcomes just goes up in a graded-like fashion. I'll go back to um, some new opportunities. I think there's going to be new opportunities through Google Street View. So there are some published studies that show that we can do some metrics of social disorganization, crime indicators kind of, uh, but I think it's murky still and we need to work on what we, we mean by using Google Street View to characterize neighborhoods. So hopefully tomorrow in the discussion we'll have some stuff come out about that. 
there's interest in microscale environments, and then Canoe could provide that excellent place uh, for people who've worked really hard on microscale environments in, say, one city, and add it to uh, add it to the data for other people to use. As we all know, the data that, say, the federal government collects or other researchers, uh, other researchers collect get used later on in ways we never imagined, right? So this consortium is, is so important for that. Um, we think we should, we'd like to synthesize research on metrics of the social environment, collective efficacy, social capital, and we can debate what that means like forever, but we could, we could also decide on something that we could get at there and try to add it I think there's a lot of in, uh, investigator-driven data out there uh, using G GPS on people's movements that can, you could likely capitalize. And I think there needs, some partner there needs to be partnership development, but that's true for every group. That's my other picture. Midterm goals, historic data, but that's, that's also true for every uh, group. Uh, identifying neighborhoods undergoing a rapid uh, socio-demographic change, uh, particularly new Canadians and changing uh, neighborhood environments food environment landscapes, and this, the coding of images from Google Street View systematically. In terms of um, who's in the group, like everybody in the room is in the group, <laughs> as far as I can, uh, I hope, uh, because there's, there's overlap, right, uh, for everybody who's uh, presented so far today. Um, in terms of funding that's in place, uh, Dan Fuller has a CRC in this area we can build from. Uh, Jim is going to talk tomorrow a bit more about 360-degree video in urban areas and early childhood development, my own CRC, and uh, I have a Public Health Agency of Canada funding for the next, uh, up until 2020, to work on the utilitarian walking of Canadians. And we'll, we've already piloted walkability measures, putting them into the research data centers for hundreds of thousands of Canadians. We'd like to do it for all the postal codes so that everybody has access uh, to that. Um, and there must be more. Uh, in terms of a couple of challenges, um, I think scales around what, what we measure, uh, what scale we use for different types of metrics at the neighborhood level uh, it should be the source of some debate. Uh, the opportunity of the high quality 2016 census is absolutely there. I think there's opportunities around GPS and cell phone data that have not been exploited. And I think lastly, this idea of what's the ideal geographic link, I think is uh, something that all the groups will be uh, concerned about. So, oh, that's the end. So thanks. give access to um, walkability uh, index that's currently available uh, and so you'll provide access for all Canadian cities will you and will so, it be part of your quick win right so what we have done is damn that's my PhD student oh my god um, uh, what we have done is calculated uh, walkability metrics for all CCHS respondents back to 2003. Um, that's, that's pretty good, so hundreds of thousands of postal codes. We need to do more. Uh, they're currently uh, being tested for validity in the research data center at, at McGill. So as soon as it's ready and they were not giving out you know, problem data and so on, it's, it's going to be readily available. The project for Public Health Agency of Canada is to do it is to have these measures for every postal code and to, to go back in time as well. And as soon as the, the canoe provides the, the way to get that out to people. So there is no way that as part of your quick wins, the canoe community would have access to walk score, walkability index quickly. You know, the, the walk score is a proprietary I know. thing, right? So, and you know, for most researchers, you can't, un you can't open that up and look in the box and tinker with it. So a lot of people get a little frustrated with it. You know, if, if people need quick wins on that, I would say population density is an excellent proxy quick uh, for a lot of these metrics. It uh, correlates very highly. Uh, I think we have these, um, like I said, it fairly quickly in terms of the walkability metrics for the CCHS respondents, and we are working towards all so, so it's as quick as it can go because there's like heavy duty programming and stuff, right? Yeah. So I, I have some comments on that. We have a lot of interest, so I think we'll extend the questions a little bit. Do you want to pass this on? If that's okay with you guys. Yeah, sure. So, okay. Mm -hmm. so, um, so
so it really is, uh, so I can actually comment on that. Oh, so, okay, okay. So the walkability metrics uh, uh, for so UBC, we uh, Larry Frank has been developing its walkability metrics for the last twenty plus years. So we're happy to collaborate with the Canoe and all the team members here. So we have already developed the walkability surface for two thousand six and two thousand eleven for Vancouver and Surrey area. We have walkability surface for. Um, you know, Toronto, we have walkability surface for Waterloo, uh, Victoria, and all, all, all kinds of, you know, the, uh, you know uh, the, around the world, we actually have developed walkability surface. So we are happy to collaborate with Canoe to provide, you know, methodology. And in terms of actually, you know, you know providing data linkage to uh, the data that, set that we already have. And to comment on uh, what you said, um, an excellent presentation, by the way. Um, so there are two things to consider when talking about walkability. One is the um, types of data that you use to build a walkability surface. Um, so whether you use the land cover, uh, L, you know, LDVI or something like that, or you use a parcel level data set, uh, which requires uh, you know, heavy coordination with the municipality to get those data set. And um, those two things are you know, the critical things to talk about. Um, and the parcel level data set is, is uh, basically what a lot of the majority of the walkability research has been using to develop walkability. Um, and, and the second, um, there's a level of data. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm on board with Marianne and um, uh, the Professor Habib about the you know, transportation perspective. Um, this, uh, not just the walkability matters, but also the accessibility. So the, you know, the regional accessibility uh, by auto and transit also affects you know, the travel behavior and physical activity. So not only just the level of data, but you know, the, the scale of data matters when you talk about walkability, not just your, you know, beyond your neighborhood boundary. So those two things are really key things to talk about. Uh, and the lastly, you know, the, we already have these walkability data sets developed for uh, some of the regions in Canada. So to avoid duplication of efforts, um, you know, we might as well think about quick wins. What, what can we do about this? So. Hi, um, I'm just wondering what are some of the built environment characteristics that includes the physical environment and also um, natural environment landscape um, characteristics within the neighborhoods that you'd be considering to um, study that contributes to the walkability of neighborhoods? So I think we all have kind of hinted that, you know, walkability may impose a penalty on in terms of noise or air pollution or heat. Uh, so like I think people want and to add a whole suite of things to study collectively. I do think the evidence though is pretty clear that walkability and people who uh, engage in physical activity because they live in walkable places, it outweighs the, uh, the penalties in terms of air pollution and um, and noise, like that's the emerging evidence, right? So people need to move. We need to clean up our cities for sure. We need to make cities quieter, absolutely. But we need to not tell people that they shouldn't be moving, right? There are also exposures to sunlight, shade, and um, mostly public health studies and also health services research studies. Um, that improves the health and well-being of people who are exposed to these environments, um, as well as um, a certain type of pathways and areas where you can stop and sit. Microenvironments. Exactly. Yeah, especially more for older Canadians. Right? Yeah, absolutely. For older Canadians, especially. Right. Yeah. So they're being considered in well, the study? Uh, well, I think that's where the Google Street View stuff comes in in terms of what we can do uh, at local scales. And, and, you know, I think we need students to be really creative here on those kinds of metrics and getting them standardized for other people to use. How you figure to measure the food environment? So there's lots of research yeah. on this, right? And typically there's an absolute measure in terms of what bad stuff is there, an absolute measure in terms of what good stuff is there, and then a ratio, a relative measure of good to bad. Uh, there's really good data available on uh, from the Canadian Business Registry, uh, from um, 
uh, uh, DMTI data available at universities where we can characterize retail food environments uh, really well. Yeah. Uh, a little hesitant because I, I think maybe it's sort of obvious, but still, it, I really feel this energy about the, it's not really an elephant in the room, but it's something that we have to be sure to not lose sight of, that a couple structural things. I mean, one, there's huge overlaps between these groups. So this is obviously something we can talk about, and again, it's obvious, but it really, again, sort of John and I taking a little bit of a step back, we have to be really careful that we uh, use that to our advantage. I mean, right now it's early days, and the and the and canoe is set up with these. You know, we have the boxes, and I know no one believes those boxes are firm. And again, stating the obvious, but I I think we should be very very deliberate in what overlap there is. And even though we would never do this intentionally, uh, being absolutely sure not to have any silos with this stuff, or else it's obviously completely uh, against the the purpose. And then along those lines, I think some of these exposures. Um, you know, this issue of confounding, residual confounding, causality. Again, it's been it's been said, and it's it's probably an obvious point, but I um, I think that should be a real focus um, of of the of of canoe that that is a that is something that we we work centrally. If there's a limited amount of energy, time, and money, um, understanding the potential confounding, and so that we can get to the the exposures that are critical. Um, because everyone seems to have, understandably, a little bit of bias about their given paradigm, whether it's walkability, et cetera, but they're obviously deeply entwined. And I, I've heard a little bit about that, but I think if Canoe doesn't make that a central theme, disentangling, confounding variables, leveraging the strengths we have to get to that point, uh, potential opportunity loss. So sorry for the editorial. It's, again, obvious, but I think I, I just want to set that <laughs> seed. seed. Thanks. Uh, I, so I, I had some questions about sort of neighborhood stress and what variables might be uh, available there. And the two that come to mind that I've used quite a bit are, you know, traffic traffic accidents, uh, which often have fairly highly resolved data. So it's a measure of insecurity in the walkability environment, mm -hmm. and then uh, crime data. Yeah. And you know, so and I don't have a good sense of what's available nationally for that. But I, I think that's worth looking at. And yeah, I mean, I, for sure, in terms of the uh, traffic accidents, and, and Audrey could speak even more in detail about that. That you know, different municipalities have different uh, data collection on that, and it's it's actually quite good if you <laughs> spend the time. It's just getting sort of this national picture on there. I think it'd be it's a little bit harder for sure. Uh, neighborhood stress and crime. Uh, again, these tend to be municipal level data sets and not necessarily national level. Uh, having said that, I think we might be able to do some kind of sampling through G Google Street View for graffiti or cues of social disorganization or something creative there that we can get a bit of a picture nationally. But I, th I think we need some students like really being creative on that on that front. Yeah, and then the, yeah. the second thought was uh, biomarkers of stress like cortisol dysregulation. How many of the cohorts have that, and mm -hmm. how could you? Because what you can do then is you can do a Bayesian profiling analysis. So you actually profile the characteristics of the people that are in high stress, and you get away from this problem of collinearity that you're actually mm -hmm. sort of trying to predict the people's characteristics who are already in the high stress zones. And then you can map it and show the spatial distribution. That might make for a more convincing, you know having the biomarkers represented, and I don't know if that's available, but. Yeah, I'm just trying to think on the Canadian Health Measures Surveys. So if those of you are familiar with it, it's a really in, uh, detailed um, sort of within the skin look at the health of the Canadian population. I just don't know about the cortisol. I don't remember, but maybe someone can help me out with that. But it, yeah, I mean, everything, I, absolutely, you know, it's just, it, it becomes this issue of what's the, what's research now? Like what's primary research? And what is Canoe trying to do to put together some indicators that would really help cohorts sing and dance a little more than they're currently singing and dancing? And I think, um, I think that's what we need to decide. So I think within the groups, I think primary research shouldn't be stifled like 
I'll never say, I would never say that, right? But there will be some sort of custodial types of activities, and then there will be some primary research types of activities, I suspect. And that, I would say, is more along the lines of sort of, you know, new research. Oh. You're welcome.